The force of the two blasts, 12 seconds apart, said it all. What struck you about it? Um, just the magnitude of it. Uh, it wasn't something small. It wasn't something insignificant. Within minutes, more than a thousand police and federal law enforcement agents would embark on the largest investigation and manhunt of its kind in the United States. By the time you got to the crime scene, this is really what it looked like, correct? Yeah, it was a scene of utter uh, devastation and carnage. There was evidence strewn all over the place. At FBI headquarters, Chief of the National Security Branch, Stephanie Douglas, was keenly aware of the stakes. We had to be concerned that there were other bombs or other co-conspirators elsewhere outside of Boston. Authorities knew at least one killer was on the loose, but where and what next? By Tuesday, investigators had started piecing together the pressure cooker bombs, identifying them as similar to devices in an Al-Qaeda bomb-making manual. We were collecting pieces of uh, shrapnel that had been contained inside the bombs, pieces of the pressure cooker bombs, pieces of the backpacks that had been used to uh, uh, contain the bomb. A major break in the case came less than 36 hours after the attack. A couple of people from our counterterrorism division came in with a laptop like this, and they said, we think we know who did it. Of the more than 12,000 videos from businesses and marathon spectators, something unmistakable at the second blast site. You see a man in a white ball cap. Um, the hat is turned around backwards, walking into the frame of the shot. He places that backpack down on the ground, sliding it off his shoulder. A short time later, maybe 15 minutes later, he makes a cell phone call. And after that cell phone call concludes, very shortly thereafter, you hear the first bomb go off uh, farther down near the finish line. He glances quickly to the left, but then walks, uh, walks diligently and deliberately to the right about 15 to 20 seconds after he departs the view of the camera and the second bomb goes off. That video has never been seen by the public, but is expected to be shown at trial in November. What did that suggest to you when this man took a cell phone call before he, walking away? That there was another conspirator. That co-conspirator was identified later that day, another crucial lead. And this video depicted uh, the individual we then called Black Hat, walking with White Hat uh, down Boylston Street, both of them carrying black backpacks. It had been three full days, and with the suspects still at large, a game-changing decision. Today, we are enlisting the public's help to identify the two suspects. Hours passed, and yet no tips identifying Joe Carr and Tamerlan Sarnayev by name. But for the brothers, things were about to unravel. How important was it to you and to the Bureau and to everybody else involved in the investigation that the two suspects be taken alive? Very, very important. But that's not what happened. They have explosives, some type of grenades. They're in between houses down here. Shots fired. Following an eight-minute firefight in Watertown, police wrestled a wounded Tamerlan to the ground. His brother, driving an alleged stolen car, tried to free him. Instead, police say he ran him over. Tamerlan was fingerprinted and finally identified by name. Brother Joe Carr, also shot, was discovered hiding in a boat after a day-long lockdown. He was less than two-tenths of a mile from where he'd abandoned his vehicle. He's got a sniper's rifle pointed right at yes. his head yes. because he was still a threat. You he was still know. a threat. We didn't know if he had bombs on him. We didn't know if he had uh, uh, weapons on him. Joe Kart Sarnayev will stand trial in November.